It is now 6.01, Monday, November 13th. We'd like to call this regular uh, meeting of the Jacksonville Planning Advisory Board to order at this time. We'll have the Pledge of Allegiance by Grace Halbrick and the invocation by Dr. Lassonde. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Now, Lord, just uh, thank you for the beautiful day you gave us. We're just coming off the, the uh, heels of uh, Veterans Day, and we're just uh, so thankful for the military presence in this town. And as we move forward, you know, we, I just want to give them special thanks for what they do. Having served myself, you know, I know what that's like. So for the veterans who have given their lives, those who are serving and, and their families, we just thank you for blessing their lives and taking care of us. With the citizens of Jacksonville, we thank you for the blessings you've given us. We live in such a great community. And as we come together as an advisory board tonight, we ask for your wisdom, your guidance, you know, that uh, you know, what is uh, best for the city of Jacksonville, uh, not uh, best for any particular organization or whatever, but uh, just, just for the city. So as we do some smart planning, we look for your wisdom in that, and, uh, and things will always work out as you, you have the ultimate game plan. So uh, we thank you for being here tonight and, and all the hard work that's gone on behind the scenes to bring this meeting together, and as we just ask for your blessings through the night and moving forward, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no corrections, uh, may we get a motion for approval of the agenda as presented. Motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Dr. Hassan, second by Steve Forney. Okay. Any discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like. Motion passes. Uh, review and approval of the minutes. I believe uh, Steve has an yep. amendment. If there be one amendment, uh, and that's above your signature block, adopted this 13th day of November, not 14th. Everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. Noting this exception, uh, that we have a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Motion, motion by Grace. Second. Second. By Matt. Any discussion? All those in favor, motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like. Motion passes. City Council update. You're up, Logan. Well, no major uh, updates at this point. Just happy election season has came and gone and got reelected. So I'll be here four more years with you guys, and hopefully the mayor will let me stay on this committee. And I appreciate it and happy to serve with you guys. So thank you. Congratulations, so, and we're glad it. to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now, there being no old business, we'll go right to new business. And Jeremy, you're first up, I assume. Advisory board. Agenda item one is for two Avenue use permit and type three site plan for a telecommunications tower. This is the site before you at 221 Merle Avenue, um, just behind the Circle Drive Apartments. This property is owned by Duke Energy, who is also your applicant. The property is zoned residential multifamily high density and in that zoning district telecommunication towers require a special use permit and that's why it's before this board tonight. Properties to the south are zoned corridor commercial undeveloped and then the apartments residential multifamily high density and then across um, the creek is a uh, undeveloped property zoned residential single family seven and then the single family development along Shore Road Road Fields Road. Again, this project has been submitted by Duke Energy. It is for a proposed 99-foot tower. Uh, specifically, this is what Duke has termed a Cambian tower. It is going to be predominantly for their use, and they're used during emergency operations in the moment of catastrophe for communication within their system. Um, part of their request was a relief from the Type A buffering and fencing standard required by the use specific standards for telecommunication telecommunication towers reason being is there's an existing natural buffer on this on this site as well as the fence that surrounds the duke uh, distribution site compound uh, staff is proposing along with their recommendation of approval 
that this relief be granted by the city council and would be part of the planning board's recommendation if you so choose it. Um, with all that being said, I will say again, staff is recommending approval of this request with findings of fact A through G being found in the affirmative and that the project offers a valuable service to the community. Representatives from Duke's legal staff and technical staff are here to answer any questions along with city staff. Thank you. Jeremy, can you show us on this picture that we're looking at exactly where that tower would be located? So let me get my refresher here of the site. Um, and just so I can make sure I'm pointing it out to you. If the, if the uh, telemarking is on, which is not, um, if media could turn the uh, writing on for me, oh, you got and something. I will mark it yeah, out you got for something you. there now. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I jumped it from it. There we go. It's right in that area. And uh, on the site plan, I will show you the area um, that is right there. If you look at that building, that'll give you a reference point. If you look at the aerial, that rectangular square building. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yep. So what's the distance between that point and the back of those apartments? Without the plan showing that specifically, I could only estimate, and it would be. This is 115. Um, mm -hmm. 115 from the property line that um, adjoins. Uh, Trinity United Methodist Church. Okay. Um, so a, a little further than that, but uh, without the exact measurement showing, that's is something I can give you there approximate. A, a tower is set back. The, one of the requirements of the UDO is that towers are, the setback is at least the tower height is their fall zone. So, mm -hmm. um, and this one's roughly 100 feet. It is so the tower itself is 95 feet, and then there's a four foot lightning rod, but that keeps it under the um, 100 foot distance, which is the FAA's trigger point for lighting and whatnot. Uh, we part of our review, and it's been many months ago, but we did have traffic email traffic conversations with base uh, Marine Corps Air Station um, representatives who, due to the height and its location. Um, had no issues and were not requiring anything additional um, beyond FAA requirements. Um, this tower is not proposing lighting. However, mm -hmm. city council is, or this board could recommend a condition to add lighting, but it does not meet that threshold. We do get a lot of ospreys. Mm -hmm. I, from where I live, mm -hmm. I can see the substation yep. and the tower or the, uh, the steeple on the Methodist church. And because we are on kind of the highest point, the Ospreys do like coming over there. It's in the flight path overlay district, which is why it's capped at 100 feet. They couldn't mm -hmm. go over okay. 100 right. okay. per that. So you're, you are correct. They do fly right over that area. That's right. Sometimes midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, and it does shake the house. <laughs> Could add a condition to it that we want some kind of lighting there, just just in case. Even though we it's have not in required. the past, we have with uh, previous towers mm -hmm. under the mm -hmm. Unified Development Ordinance. Even if they have not triggered the need for a light, that has been a condition <coughs> we've added. Mm -hmm. um, it would just require them to revise yeah. their plans and add that condition on it uh, before the city stamp yeah. approval on it. Does it do because of the proximity to the apartments, I not I don't recommend we have lighting. Right. And the base said they do not. Correct. Right. The base is not requiring lighting as part of any review. <coughs> right. So will they keep those two buildings there also? Yes, ma'am. There is, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, there is no demolition proposed at this site. Very good questions. Any other discussion? Recommendation is in, in order. Someone wants to make a motion. 
I recommend that uh, we, the planning board, recommend to city council that they do approve this based on the findings of fact, A through G being found to the affirmative, and that this project offers a valuable service to the community. Do we also have to um, yes. make a recommendation of relief from the, uh, the buffer? Yes, we do. Okay. Would you do that also? And also be relief from the buffer. Okay. I'll second that. We have a second from Dr. Lasson. Motion by Steve, second by Dr. So, any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. Motion passes. Thank you very much. One down, two to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, members of the Planning Advisory Board, agenda item two is a proposed rezoning at 3163 and 191 Drummer Kellum Road. The request is to rezone from residential multifamily low density and corridor commercial to residential multifamily high density. Note the location of the property properties in question uh, before you on the screen. Again, this is adjacent to the corner of New Bern Highway, um, US 17, and Drummer Kellum Road. So this is two parcels. Um, 3163 Newburn Highway and 191 Drummer Kellum. The track one, which is 191, is approximately 22 acres and is currently zoned residential multifamily low density. And a portion of 3163 Newburn Highway is zoned corridor commercial. They are proposing at approximately 6.47 acres of that tract be rezoned to residential multifamily high density. It's not highlighted. Okay. It wasn't highlighted. Okay. So it's only it's on this portion is part of that property. Sorry. That's the only part? That's correct. That's it. That okay. is the rear six point Got um, it. six point four seven acres of that that track. That is uh, the thirty one sixty three is approximately seventeen acres total. Mm -hmm. um, they are only um, proposing to rezone six roughly approximately six and a half acres of it to residential multifamily high density. Surrounding the other uh, section. Yes, sir. What is that little cutout that comes back into it? I'm sorry. Which You've got a rectangle. Half a drummer, Kelly. That's somebody else's property. That, that is a separate property. Separate property? Yes. But he does have right away on at least two points of contact there. That's right. The, the property does touch. It's While it is small here, that is approximately 45 uh, feet wide on one side okay. and 45 on the other, which is the minimum requirement for that zoning district okay. which um, I believe is close to it <laughs> yes um, yeah. so we're putting a high density zoning in the middle of that a bunch of low densities if, if this area is zoned rezoned for high density What's the maximum number of, of units we could put in this parcel? Or the, it is 25 units per acre is the density allotment. Um, whether you could actually get that many in there, I do not know. Um, uh, there are several factors that come into play, obviously infrastructure, um, streets, utilities and whatnot, buffering, landscaping can all take up a considerable portion of the land. Um, do you know, we have not received a proposal for this development at this time and this is how many acres total they are proposing to rezone 29.28 acres I remind the board that although multifamily cannot be in the first 350 feet of a major highway if they were to rezone the entire back half to quarter commercial there would be no density maximum so the residential multifamily high density has a cap of I think Jeremy's correct at 25 units per acre there is no cap in the quarter commercial zone, correct? Correct. Not that it matters, but so what, what, basically what you're saying is you can put a lot of houses, you can put a lot of units in there. Or a lot of apartments. Correct? Correct. Okay. An example of low Maybe. density to high density would be single family to townhouses as well. So currently the residential multifamily low density and um, itself allows single family at, um, I believe, if 
5,000 square foot lot minimum, and but it also allows duplexes at 4,500 square feet lots minimum. You would do you would, duplexes work uniquely is that you would develop them on a 9,000 9, acre lot or 9,000 square foot lot and then divide it down the middle and have a duplex unit on either side. So that's where the 4,500 comes from. Um, and those are the two residential uses allowed in residential multifamily low density, single family and duplex. Corridor commercial allows. So, so real quick, so it's 8.71 units per acre on the low density and it's 25 on the high density maximums. Target. No, it's, I, I was going to say I had not gotten through the whole presentation, um, oh. so I apologize. Uh, uh, again, these properties are split zoned. Uh, one parcel is zoned corridor commercial. The larger portion, the larger track, is zoned residential multifamily low density. To the north is FOSS recycling and uh, salvage zone corridor commercial. To the west is residential single family seven single family. To the south and southeast or southwest is residential multifamily used for predominantly single family. Uh, the remainder of the corridor commercial zoning at 3163 New Bern Highway is a large, largely undeveloped. However, there is an electrical contractor's office near the highway. There is single family all along the east side of Drummer Kellum Road. The Camden land use plan identifies this property as medium density residential for future development, as well as the smaller six and a half acre lot as mixed use. In addition, properties to the southeast and to the south are all proposed for mixed use, whereas the predominant zoning to mm -hmm. or land use designations to the north and south is medium density residential with the single family in the Jacksonville Commons area identified as low density residential. Before you on the screen right now is what the future rezone parcel would look like if the city if the planning board recommended approval and it made it to city council and then if they recommended approval. Um, what, what following you, that there would be an annexation uh, because of the larger tract the law uh, is not currently within the city's limits. Uh, and if they want to use city utilities and have city services, annexation would be required. Um, and they would have a recombination plat, recombining, moving the parcel line and creating the full 29, approximately 29 acres uh, that they are proposing for residential multifamily high density. Didn't I read in stuff there? They're going to ask for annexation. They will at some point in the future if they want city city services yes sir okay i mean where, where's the access point to this piece of property mm -hmm. so right now they have access uh, <laughs> off of uh drummer kellum and then through the commonly owned property at the front um, but a as of this time we haven't seen a proposed development we don't know where an access would come from you know with any future development so the act the front access would be through barker electric that is cr Somewhere. i would assume uh, in Lori Morris is here from Tidewater. She may be able to address that. Uh, as you can see on the aerial, it has been used as farmland predominantly in the past. I can only assume they've either accessed it through the property along Newburn Highway or off of a common driveway on Drummer Kellum near the water tower site. So that small little jet in off of Drummer Kellum, do those people own that? Is that part of, I mean, it's... This right here? Yeah. That is a water tower yeah. owned by, oh, okay. I, I believe, either... <clears throat> is the city water tower. Mm -hmm. okay. <sighs> With all that said though, um, staff is recommending approval of the rezoning. As Findings of fact, Anthony J have been found in the affirmative and that the rezoning advances the public interest by creating a more development opportunities. The mixed use category of the Camel use plan has multifamily, even if it's in a lesser degree as part of its identified land use type. And that's where uh, we believe the Camel use plan supports the rezoning.
I can see some concerns. Sure. Uh, number one, <coughs> my number one concern would probably be traffic on Drummer Kettlem Road or on Newburn Highway. I'm not sure what the, you know, what, I mean, I'm sure this is something that they would have to address when they try to develop <coughs> this. Right. When they submit any kind of development, a plan preliminarily, we will review it with the City Transportation Services Department and with Drummer Kellum and Newburn Highway both being DOT facilities, they would also review and determine what traffic analysis, if any, and uh, traffic uh, street road improvements would be required. But I can also see that when you have your public hearing for city council, you'll probably have people in that neighborhood that will say, the last thing we need on that road is more traffic, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll bring up that. I mean, that'll be something that this, whoever this, they'll have to address that, you know, or else you'll be blindsided at your council meeting, and we wouldn't want that to happen. Um, and I did not mention earlier, and it's not that this, you know, in my presentation, I apologize, I was sidetracked. Um, the request was submitted by Harry and Lisa Brown for the request to rezone uh, the approximate 29 acres. <clears throat> okay, what's your pleasure? I mean, we're, we're, we're here to make a recommendation. Sure. Everybody's had a chance to ask questions, so. It's either a yay or nay, and then yeah. city council will make the final decision. <clears throat> well, the fact that, you know, they, they meet all the facts. Uh, I mean, um, I think it's where you have to look at your recommendation there because they, they, you check all the boxes off, and then it's just we're going to replat these two and, re, you know, rezone it and, and move ahead. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I don't see a substantial argument against it. So is that a motion? Well, <clears throat> so I'm going to make even a, if it is development for housing. Yeah. So we I'm, have short housing in Jacksonville. <laughs> All right, we so need I'm, housing. So I'm going to make a, a motion that we go ahead and approve the rezoning request based on findings of facts A through J and affirming, and this will advance the public's best interests. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? second. Whoa. Second by Steve. Sorry. <laughs> okay. We've had plenty of discussion. Any more discussion? I'm, I'm certainly. Glad that you've asked questions. Okay, and Mr. Souza knows that we have questions, and so he'll relay that to council, I'm sure. Uh, hearing no other discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, like. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Both of these projects are proposed. Uh, agenda item one and two are proposed to go to the city council's second meeting in January. Oh, good. That gives plenty of time to plenty of time for people to know. So they don't show. They will, and we'll do our notifications. And that's, and I think we've alluded to it before. Staff is we're trying because of the local newspapers change in publishing. They sure. only are published three days, yeah. four days a week, it, and we have to get our ads in within two weeks prior to in order to make it to our notices. The um, Doing back-to-back -back meetings scares us because we wouldn't want this board to need more information, table and item we've advertised for a public hearing. So we're kind of getting away from that. There will be times where it makes sense, but just so you know, that's why it is. The, the spacing's there because the council's not meeting in December. But typically this would go to council in December, um, but it will be in their January meeting along with uh, agenda item three. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item three. Ryan, you get this one? I'll get this one, Mr. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, planning board members, thank you for having me tonight. Agenda item three is a, a uh, citizen requested unified development ordinance text amendment uh, to several articles of the UDO, uh, specifically section 4.1 and 4.2, article 5.1, and article 9.4 definitions. Um, so this amendment was submitted by Mr. John Hunter, who's the president of Korean Clean Auto Spas Incorporated. He is here with us tonight. Um, he requested revisions to the Unified Development Ordinance back in around summertime, July, August time frame. We started having discussions and had quite a bit of back and forth, um, raised some concerns with um, sometimes when th this, nothing against Mr. Hunter, but when we get a request, 
you know, it's, this is what I want, but then there's other things that staff points out. There's other articles, other sections that we have to factor into that. So for example, um, the request was to create four definitions for four different um, use types uh, within the car wash family. So we're gonna change the definitions. That also means that we have to change the use table to list those four. And then what zones are they gonna go in? And so that's kind of one of those things where sometimes a simple request can kind of balloon, if you will, and uh, create some challenges while staff works with the applicant to try to create something that meets the Unified Development Ordinance so that we can bring forth a, an amendment that kind of fits within our uh, format and um, flows with the UDO and we don't miss something that creates a uh, contradiction or something that's not clear later on. Um, so Mr. Hunter's uh, amendment would, as I stated a second ago, create four car wash types with definitions. They would be permitted in the CC and industrial zones, regardless of the type. Mr. Hunter's requesting that we establish a 4,000 foot separation from existing express car wash facilities with exemptions, um, establish parking standards, so once again, if we had a parking center for car wash, now there's going to be four types and the parking ratio for the first one may not be what needs to be on the fourth one because it would be too much or not enough. So we work through some of those issues. Um, and um, within 5.1 parking, there's also stacking spaces and configuration. So that's part of the amendment that we had to kind of factor in and um, as I stated with the four new definitions it would eliminate the current single car wash definition right now this is just a broad definition and Mr. Hunter's requesting that we kind of get specific on four different types so as I stated we've been discussing this since he applied back in August and how while staff agrees with some portions of this request staff is not in a position to support the amendment at this time the way that it is um, drafted because we have concerns with creating nonconformities. Um, currently, it doesn't fall under the current UDO format. And what I mean by that is Article 7 nonconformities deals with whether or not a nonconforming use or nonconforming site feature, when does it go away, when can it be rebuilt, or if it can't be, et cetera. And Mr. Hunter's request puts that information in Article 4, and it, they don't, it doesn't align with the way that the UDO was drafted back in, you know, and adopted back in 2014. Um, additionally, you know, we're a little off on our parking requirements. Um, I understand while Mr. Hunter, you know, he's, he's come up with one number. Staff looks at it from a standpoint of if you have, if you have, three or four people, let's just say you have three people on staff on a maximum shift, that you have three potential drivers, um, plus you gotta have one's gotta be ADA spot. So that would be four spaces at minimum for you to have, and then that doesn't factor in shift change. But it also doesn't factor in, well, what if somebody rides on the Jackson Transit, if they get an Uber, Lyft, taxi, whatever it may be, get dropped off, they walk, they bike, whatever it may be. But so we're off a little bit on, on the parking standards. Um, based on the definition, um, we're concerned with some enforcement challenges. i uh, give you an example. If we have a current, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it definition one, two, three, four. If we have a definition three now, all they got to do is make some tweaks to their business um, standard. They could basically, well, I'm going to hire somebody to, to perform um, a more in-depth detail than the tunnel wash well that may not have been how it started but that's how it is today so then that impacts other people making requests to build car washes that then let's say that okay well you can't meet the spacing so you you can't go there and then that business that had created that that service they do away with it so i mean it kind of becomes a little bit of a chasing our tail situation uh, and that's a concern that we have um, we also have some concerns about the anti-competitive uh, effects that, that a 4,000 foot spacing um, separation would have on it. And to tie in with that, it seems excessive because of, 
you know, no real identified public health or safety concern has been established. Normally what we see is a use that is separated from another use. And what I mean by that, so not same use to same use, but use to a different use. So one of the ones that we have here in Jacksonville that is the largest um, separation would be an adult business has to be at least, I think it's 1,500 feet from a religious institution, daycare, residential area. So the adult business has to be separated from those. If it's too close, they can't open there. We also have um, family care group homes, which the state has gotten uh, very involved with. They've basically told us what's the maximum amount that, that the mayor and council can adopt as far as a, a separation. So that would be a same use separation to same use separation, but those are predominantly within a residential zone. And I think that's to kind of help you in one regard, you help to allow those those residential facilities within a single family district. It also ensures you don't have a a close um, clustering to where it becomes too many within a concentrated area. And tied in with that is um, just legis this concerns with where kind of the legislature has been doing the way that they've been adopting rules and regulations here that impact us is that you know, we kind of have a feeling that this may be a little bit of an overreach. And what we've seen is we've seen ETJs basically taken away from cities where cities and towns got a little overzealous in ETJs, um, where, you know, we, we're limited on what we can do with group homes. We're limited on what we can do with billboards. We're limited what we can do with cell phone towers. And I believe that's all because municipalities have created laws that they then go to the legislature and the legislature says, cities, towns, you cannot do this. So we have concerns with it. Um, that being said, I've, on, page, uh, on the second page, which is page 54, I've tried to kind of provide a summary of what I just went over of, of what the amendment would look like as requested by the applicant. And then the, uh, the attachment A, which is the ordinance, um, the first couple of pages there's a lot of the existing table that's remaining unchanged. And if you get on down to page um, 60, under vehicle sales and service, you'll see the underlining. That's where we've basically added um, those four car wash types. Uh, on page 62, you will see under the use specific standards, that's where the applicant has requested to create that 4,000 foot radius, um, an exemption underneath that section. That's the part where I said that really would belong in Article 7 and what's written versus what's currently in Article 7, they don't really align. Pretty much a non-conforming situation, you know, at some point you have to bring non-conforming site features into compliance. And if it's a non-conforming use, then if it ceases to exist, it's got to go away. Um, and then 5-1, basically the parking uh, information that I alluded to. Uh, once again, the parking table, you've got quite a few. Um, the whole table's there, and the changes you'll find there about midway on page 66. And then on the bottom of 667, you'll see that we already had two standards for required stacking stand-in spaces. So we had to add two additional ones and kind of tweak those existing two with the, um, the stacking information provided there. And then the definitions, which are on page 68 and 69. So although not a public hearing, Mr. John Hunter's here. I'm sure that he would um, be happy to answer any questions the board may have. If you want to hear from him, that's certainly the board's, um, it's, it's up to you if you'd like to hear Mr. Hunter. Um, but with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions and I'll sit down and um, it, let it, the chairman and the board decide what's next. Can I ask a question before we, uh -huh. uh, we in adult businesses, mm -hmm. do, don't we have a spacing between adult businesses? Yes, we do. Yeah. What is that? Do you recall? It's got to be in the overlay, first of all. So there's only five geographic areas in Jacksonville that they can be. 
And then I believe it's a thousand or fifteen hundred feet between an adult business to an adult business. And that was so that they would not proliferate an area Correct. and turn them into something like a second front or and I'm pretty sure in typical fashion, I believe Jeremy's looking so he can tell you exactly what the UDO states as far as that, that separation there and the use standards for adult businesses. <clears throat> but it's, it's also, I think you're correct that it is from other adult businesses, but it's also from churches, churches. Daycares, I can understand parks, that. those kind of things. But that was, that was actually, I remember because I, I was on city council <coughs> when we were discussing that and it was, it was done to keep one area becoming, quote, the adult business downtown district, you know, or the uptown district, or whatever it was. And we also have, I mean, separation from billboards. We have an overlay district with billboards, and they have to be separated mm -hmm. from them as well. So, um, but with that being said, let me get back to the beginning. So, as a result, um, while we're not, as I stated earlier, we, we do not disagree with everything that Mr. Hunter has proposed based on kind of where we are. We do not believe that the amendment in its entirety is consistent with the Camel Annuals Plan Policy 52.1, uh, which states provide an atmosphere attractive to new and existing businesses and industries that will strengthen the area economy, provide opportunities for families and foster economic growth that does not adversely affect the environment, either physically or aesthetically. Therefore, staff recommends the planning board recommend denial of the UDO found in attachment A. And as Jeremy stated um, a few minutes ago, that if the board decides to rec make a recommendation one way or the other tonight, this would go to city council um, in January. Okay. All right. So this is not the final word on anything, pro or con. Yeah. The recommendation, yeah. I, I yeah. believe that um, the city council yeah. takes the board's consideration uh, very much to heart, but at the end of the day, it is a legislative decision that city council is able to make. Um, but I think that they... They use everything, whether it be staff's, uh, the board's recommendation. And then, as Jeremy also mentioned earlier, we haven't gone to the notification. Uh, in this case, it will just be a, a newspaper ad. This won't be like a rezoning where we send out everybody adjoining and post signs. This will simply be G10 today, yep. this meeting, and then um, Granicus, which is on our webpage. So you could pull up the agenda for tonight's meeting on on the G10 page and see the full agenda for any of these items. And then we will post a newspaper ad just saying that the ordinance is being proposed to be amended, but we don't send that out to anybody via first class mail or not even the car, not, the, yeah. not even the other car wash businesses in the that city. Just do not require they would us all to be do anything. grandfathered in. Well, they would be grandfathered in if something changes, but as I mentioned, if it's grandfathered in, at some point it could create an issue mm -hmm. with either compliance, um, non-conforming, whatever it may be, we'd have to determine. Or expansion. I'm sorry? Or, or expansion. expansion. Right. That's or correct. Or blew it down. That's correct. But I believe that, and Mr. Hunter can speak to this, but I believe that's kind of what he's trying to get at with the exemptions. If there's an existing location, the problem is, is if you look at the way the UDO is set up, Article 7 is very definitive on how that is and what Mr. Hunter is requesting doesn't kind of fit within <coughs> that. So, all right. City's doing this. We, we have not found anything specific to car washes. Normally when we kind of search, we look, um, we have not been able to find anything um, Mr. Hunter has not provided us with anything. There's been a little bit of dialogue there. There was some sort of a case in Wilmington, and, and it stopped, and I don't know what the details were on why it stopped. I don't know. You know, there was a, something with, there was a rezoning, so I don't know if it was a stop because it was a rezoning because it was for a car wash or if they were trying to amend the code. But I know Wilmington dealt with this a few years ago. I just don't know, you know, how that what their format was and is. Sure. All right. My, my other question is <clears throat> why the need for four different definitions for a car wash? Um, that would be a, a better question for Mr. Hunter, but if you look at it, it's basically the first one is pretty much um, where you pull up and you have a wand oh, yeah. and a brush. Mm -hmm. And then 
it just goes up from there. All right. I didn't know what the purpose was other than just defining that particular side. At the beginning there, it said corridor commercial and industrial. Mm -hmm. Are they currently allowed in industrial, or would this create them being allowed in So that's it, the asterisk at the bottom. The reason for that is it, car washes are not specifically listed in the use table today. So we lump them underneath vehicle uses. That, that's you got the categories, and then you have the specific uses. So we've always kind of allowed that under... Um, I can't remember exactly which one it is that we we allow. It actually created some questions uh, a few years back. It was a, I believe it was a special use permit for the one over near the uh, Bojangles on Piney Green Road by the Food Lion across from uh, near White Oak. And because of the way that we kind of fit it underneath that use category, it was kind of confusing. But because it wasn't spelled out, so from that standpoint, actually adding car wash whether it be one definition, whether it be four definitions, that's actually one of the components that we would actually support in terms of clearing up the UDO. <clears throat> um, you know, now whether it's one or whether it's four, but that, that would be one, that's one of those items that we would support. Because it just, it creates additional clarity that now somebody may have to call and ask, well, where does that go? Well, if you look at the definitions, the use specific standards, I'm not the use specific standards, but the um, use classifications in Article 9, it kind of talks about those things in car washes mentioned. So that just adds, that would add more clarity to where it becomes more clear than what it is today. I think it's clear now if you dive into interpreting, but it would actually be in the use table if, if that was added. Well, when you go into this, here we're always looking for clarity because you don't want to leave room for argument or whatever and so this four thousand foot separation and you said and when you put with exemptions now you just opened up all kinds of stuff so, you know someone's going to come in so what what's your definition of an exemption and well, that can be argued so many different ways so, so well you're giving them favor over this or this i mean so um and i think you know i think Thinks a lot of good, okay, but example when you get there now you've just kind of, you know, now you're walking a real fine line. What is the exemption? So, yeah, but we all want clarity. I mean, because it's like you said, when you do a rezoning request, UDOs. I mean, it's pretty cut and dry, you know. And do we? I tend to kind of want to stay away from when we start allowing exemptions. I know you get special use permits and all that, and we take that under consideration, but how do you define that, you know, with exemptions? <clears throat> yep. So, I mean, I would, in terms of to kind of try to help answer that question, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but you'd have to look at what the applicant has oh, wrote, yes. which yeah, is under I the get, Article yeah. 4.2. Yeah, I know. I, I, <clears throat> the basis of this is to not oversaturate saturate the market almost by giving yourself a franchise territory that nobody else can move into. Yes, yes. I'm sit down. Yes, please. Yeah. Mr. Hunter, if you want to go to the <clears throat> podium there. I mean, if, if that is the reason, and I think that's what you're saying it is. Um, yes, sir. So um, just a background, I'm a, a Jacksonville, well, I'm not a native, but I'm a retired Marine, 24 years, um, retired here, been in and around Jacksonville for the last 17 years. I started my company while I was on active duty back in 2016. And so I'm a, I'm a mom and pop, I'm not a national franchise company. The reason to answer a few of your questions, um, initially, um, not trying to define, I, I'm all about capitalism and, um, and growth in any company. Um, this initiative was initially started because some of the car washes that I built, like you have big national companies that own a thousand car washes that'll build right across the street from me, which is, I mean, it was not okay, but the reality is they're, they're, 
it's competition. So we, like at any competitor, but the things you have to keep in mind is a car wash is a special use property, just like a gas station. And so when you drive around Jacksonville, you see empty gas stations, and it's very rarely that you see a gas station get redeveloped into something else. So let's say hypothetically, I, these guys come in town and I do really well and they, I put them out of business. The reality is that that car wash, is, you very rarely see a car wash be redeveloped into like a McDonald's or some other mom and pop shop. It's just gonna sit there vacant. So vacant businesses don't add value, they don't add to the tax bases, they don't do anything. And same thing with, with gas stations. And then the gas stations are becoming and nothing against tobacco shops or anything like that, but you got another special use property that can't get redeveloped. Most banks don't loan um, money to, um, you know, with a gas station and a car wash, we put tanks in the ground. You got to pull them out. Like um, the most banks that it ends up seeps into, seeping into the groundwater. So most banks don't finance unless you can find a way around it, uh, contaminated soil. So that's why when you look around in a lot of areas, you see old car washes and old gas stations that's just been sitting there for someone to do something with. So my concern is, uh, the reason for this is, I separated, I created four divisions. So what I'm trying to do is, I'm not trying to knock off the small guy, the guy that just, hey, I just want to just wash cars or anything like that. What I am trying to create is a healthy, uh, competition amongst express car washes. So when you look up there, it says express car wash facilities. It doesn't say car washes. It clearly defines express car washes. And so the reason for that is because, hey, a car wash is a car wash. Reality is I love to think mine is the best, which we are the best, but um, we're a car wash. And so when you have companies that come in that build right next to you or across the street, it doesn't necessarily add that much value um, to the community. And so what I, my approach is, what I'm recommending is, is like, hey, there are plenty of places in and around Jacksonville that need more development. You know, I give an example. I have a friend of mine that's a baker. She wanted to open a bakery. So uh, the, she wanted to open a bakery in a certain part of town that was close to another bakery. But the planning board, or I guess the developer said, hey, we have a bakery that's here you can't open this because this is, you know, you can open here though. And both bakeries do really well. But if you open a bakery here and some here, somebody's going to die. Like somebody's going, like something's going to go out of business. And so if you're a small business owner, that doesn't, that doesn't help. We all know small business are, businesses are the lifeblood of, I mean, America. That's what drives our economy. So when you have these large companies coming in and pushing out small guys like me, I mean, it's, I mean, it doesn't add much to the community or to the tax base to have a bunch of buildings that's vacant. So the purpose of this was to not uh, necessarily prevent expansion or growth. If you went out uh, to answer your question, Dr. Lasan, was that, hey, what are exemptions? Where the exemptions is, hey, if I had to redevelop my car wash and make it something better, that's, I'm not trying to stop that. But what I don't want to do is if, me and you, and we offer a, a like service, and you build right next to me, you know, that doesn't add value to the community. Now, if I said, hey, new guy, we have a place here that's, you know, X amount of distance away, not only does that add value to the citizens that live in that area, but it also promotes more businesses to actually build out there. So everybody wants to come to the core, which is great. Like, the core of Jacksonville is awesome, but the reality is, we can spread out the, the community. You know, I'm just talking about car washes because that's my dog in the fight, but reality is that you can spread out development and help, you know, you guys have seen these strip malls that have empty tenants and all these other things, and it's because there's nobody out there to help bring those, those, uh, that business out there. So <clears throat> that is the purpose of this proposal. So I defined it cleared it out, and I only lined out the express car wash to it. Yes, sir. How'd you come up with the 4,000 foot? So to me, most of the time, a 4,000 foot radius, they say like a three to, in most instances for car washes, you know, before it kind of got crazy, I know you guys have seen car washes like pop out with car washes and storage units just, just pop all over the place. But typically, you know, like a, a three mile radius or something like that, usually it's kind of like a, 
that's a nice sweet spot to have a car wash because if you have a certain num amount of rooftops in that area, most people typically don't really drop more than three miles or four miles to go get a car wash. They're gonna go to where something is just most convenient. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just curious how you came up with that number in your research. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? So, Hope so, I cleared so, up. So, I mean, I asked uh, Ryan this earlier. I mean, so with this is this is your deal. This is your your livelihood and your expertise. When you look at other cities like Wilmington or Greenville, places like that, do you do you see that same issue there, or how they've tried to handle it? I've seen issues where there's a problem. Like I give an example where. I was doing market research, so for example, in Wilmington, there was um, a car wash on the same side of the road in an uh, open space and another car wash, like right next to each other. And I'm like, you know, it didn't become a big deal until a lot of private equity money kind of came into it and they started buying out small guys like me or they'll push them out or something like that. Um, I, my car wash came from, deployment money and TSP money and that's that's how I built it so I don't you know have deep pockets like that but the reality is that once um, and again I'm all about capitalism I'm not you know I don't want y'all to think that hey you know but the reality is I love this community I've seen it grow and I think there there's a smart way that or smarter way we can probably try to manage that without putting people out of business when everybody stays in business, everybody wins. I guess what, uh, and probably, since you're proposing the change, the the onus, or the, the responsibility is on, on your part to try to do a little research to find out what works in other cities and what doesn't work in other cities. So if you're going to make your argument the way you proposed it here, you, you need to be able to, to show that with some examples so that when you come before city council, because that's the next place you're going to go anyway. I mean, I, whether, whether we approve or don't approve, it's going to go to city yeah. council. And you're yeah. going to have your say before city council. I mean, you'll still have another yeah. shot at now, it, you know. Now, for what it's worth, I, I do believe there are times when we have, through just freedom of you can go anywhere you want, that we've seen street corners and we've seen intersections like in Wilmington, in Wilmington, I've seen uh, an intersection with four drugstores. Mm. And I knew all four were not going to make it. And they didn't. And so now you've got a big, ugly building where one of them was. And nobody's done a whole lot with it. So, but whether the council or whether the planning board should have said, hey, you can only have a drugstore within 3,000 feet of another drugstore, you, 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 you get a fine line between it's my land, I can do what I want to with it, versus <laughs> we're trying to make things good for the whole city. So I don't know where that fine line is. You know, I, I have a friend who will probably tell me, when, when I ask him this, he'll probably say something like, well, you know, you can't tell people where they can't go. And I'm going, like, okay. <laughs> and I but, but I do see yeah. what you see. I do see there are times when we have competing places in the same place, and one place has driven the other one out of business, and then it ends up sitting there vacant for forever. Yes, sir. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think there, at some point, when you look at history, at some point, somebody's got to, you know, a lot of times we want to say, hey, what are these guys doing? What, what makes sense? And I think at some point, you got to be like, hey, what's the common sense approach, even though nobody's done it? Um, and so this is probably one of those instances. You do have other places like in other, they're not in North Carolina that do it. And I didn't want to bring forth something that was outside of the state from that instance. But there are situations where I believe that um, people do do it, and I just I think there's kind of be like, a, hey, what's a what's a common sense approach that you know is for the greater good of the community? And in, 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 in my personal opinion, I think um, if you can do something like that, it does. You know, from a tax standpoint, everybody staying in business helps. With from a tax standpoint, from a community <laughs> standpoint, it helps everyone. It doesn't. Uh, the most good is spacing it out versus the least amount of good is having gaps within a, a community that can't be re re 
re redevelop because it is a special use property. You can't really, once you drop those tanks in the ground and stuff starts seeping into the ground, so you can't really do too much about it other than spend a whole heck of a lot of money to pull that stuff out, excavate it, and then mitigate all of that soil contamination. Well, be careful what you wish because someone in Raleigh may say, well, we think that we will, will dictate how they build car washes and now you won't have tanks in the ground and then that opens up a whole new can of worms because then you'll have to find a larger parcel of property to have your retention pond sitting in the back and <laughs> I agree but, like but, even my car washes yeah. you know I I, uh, I build I collect rainwater in my car washes so the rain if it rains we collect it and we use it for the wash process and we just try to do as much as we can to mitigate having storm ponds and you know it is an out of a box idea but I think that's kind of what got us here today from, from like America's standpoint, like it's, you know, mm -hmm. sure. people have different thoughts and that's what got us here. So, and, and you know what happened, you, you, you had, your, you had your business, you did a really good job <clears throat> and someone else said, Hey, I think I can go there also. And that's, you know, you, you're, if it, if you hadn't done such a good job, nobody would be sitting there trying to put a place across from you. But, uh, it's, a, it's to get, you know, it's to get, and, and I'm all about competition, so I don't want you to think that, but the reality is, it's like, when you have situations like when people build on top of uh, each other and they're very similar stocks, so like I can give you an example, McDonald's and Burger King can do it, but look how big they are. They can afford to kind of like, or Chick-fil-A, they can really build anywhere they want and still do well, but, you know, it doesn't really matter, but, uh, but I, I definitely agree with you. It is something that's not typical, but from a overall community and development and, and ushering um, mm. businesses to actually grow and grow the community, I personally think it, it helps. Mm. Would you be willing to do a shorter distance instead of Fort Valley? I am. The reason why I said that I feel like it's a cap on the area because if you're looking for you know, development to have a lot of houses, mm. right? everyone's going to want to go into those areas. If you don't want to go too far out, there won't be enough traffic, right? So, if you did half of that where there was still enough competition but still spread you out, would sure. you be willing to that? Yeah, I've always been with Ryan, like, I, you know, for me, like, there's no, there's no one that, like, works that, at a car wash that's on, like, within the development. So for me, the knowledge really comes from guys like me putting in the work and defining these things out. So the next guy behind me won't have to. Like, somebody's got to do it. And I agree with you. It's always been, you guys, Ryan, we want to be able to, like it's a partnership, in my opinion. So you can't, you know, I'm not trying to say, hey, it's got to be like this, but I am saying, hey, uh, I'm a car wash guy, you guys development guys, what's going to work for the greater good? And that's always been my approach uh, when it comes to this. Yeah, I think, I think the 4,000 raises eyebrows when we only, we only require 1,500 for adult sure. businesses. So uh, that's, that's almost three times as, as much. Um, Granted, it's for it maybe for different reasons. You know, one is economic, and the other one is more uh, overall look of the area. Um, so, you know, any other discussion? Well, I think the planning department did a good job trying to work with you and work through some of the issues. You know, and of course, with you know, they had to bring that to us and kind of lay out the format so we get to kind of hear from you and also from there. So. <clears throat> Whether this, you know, as a board, whether we approve or disapprove, whatever, I mean, it still goes to city council. So I don't want you to take it as a, a negative, you know, it can be a positive, it can be a negative, you know, coming in here. I think it's a good learning experience. I do agree with uh, Homer, you know, as you move toward the city council, um, they're going to um, probably ask a lot more details from you than we did here because we're not kind of thinking about some of those things. And of course you have, you know, our uh, representative here from the city council. And um, so he would be a good advocate. Hopefully I, he raised a good question. Are you willing to make some concessions on that? You know, but it's, it's, it's all of it. And sometimes it's, there, there's a lot you know, there. And it sounds like Ryan, Ryan's done a good job working with you. And but there's just a lot of factors in here when you start going in and changing up the UDOs and stuff like that. So. I get it, you know, as a business person, you know, I'm, I'm small business myself, you know, um, I get it. I get where you come from. So, yeah. Thank you. You might, you, you might 
look at this and say, okay, well, what, one, what things are you willing to hang on to the most? What matters the most to you? Um, I really, I would not hesitate to go out of state for my examples, if, if that will support your case. Sure. You know, because, you know, one of the things we're here for is to be that first line of, of, of uh, discussion, but also uh, we make a recommendation to the city council and then they'll hear you again, but by the time they hear you again, you'll also have additional information, mm -hmm. which, you know, will either solidify your case or will make your case depending right. on what this board decides mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, I mean, we're here to help you, okay? I mean, it's, I don't think anyone up here has ever not want to help an applicant come in here. You know, like I said, I've been on this board a long time, and I can tell you that the planning department, they go at great lengths. Sometimes I know you feel a lot of pushback, but they're, they, they challenge you because they have to look at from the legalistic standpoint. You know, there's a lot of legalities, you know, that you know, like Mr. Uh, like Homer said, you don't, we don't want Raleigh dictating how to tell you how you can build a car wash. I don't want them to dictate to me how to run my dental practice, okay? They control my license, but I don't want them telling me, you know, that I can only see so many people in an hour, okay? Um, so we're here in helping. We, I know it's quite challenging, some of the questions, and it's not a, you know, not a bad thing. It helps everybody grow. And I think you've, uh, I've known you, and, and you've done amazing uh, things with your business and your growth, you know, so I, I get that, too. You've, uh, you've done a great job. You've done a great job. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just would point out under page 55, you know, you got, you got the options, which include, you know, recommending approval. Um, as the applicants requested, you could defer action. So that, that would give Mr. Hunter time to bring back some information. We could get it before you in December, because at this point in time, we do expect to have a plan board in December. And that still keeps him in track with going to city council in January um, or uh, the last option to deny. So you got some options there. Thank you very much, Rory. It might be a great option to think about. <clears throat> I'm looking, I'm looking. I'll find my, find my page. I know I'm just I'm looking for 55 in these pages. It's 50 something. 52. I'm there. 53. Got it. Okay. So, so I'm going to make a recommendation that um, at this point in time, we table this until next month. Mm -hmm. I, I think, that, I think that's going to give uh, Mr. Hunter um, plenty of opportunity to come back before us. You know, uh, I think we need to um, allow him that time and give him that grace, you know, so that I know we presented some challenging questions to him, also work a little bit more closer with the planning department and see, um, kind of help him get more, you know, get where he needs to be and also be help him give him time to uh, prepare to go to city council. And I, I think personally that would be a great move because I, I, I'm hesitant to sit there and say yay or nay at this point. Um, it's nothing personal, but I'm just also want to extend that helping hand as a small business owner myself say, wow, okay, uh, there's some things I need to think about. There's some things that, okay, get me ready you know, and the more ready I am as you step out and look at other communities and maybe get some more ideas, you know, and come back to us, I think it's a great opportunity we can uh, afford to give to you. <laughs> and we have a motion to defer action, <clears throat> correct? Right, doctor? Defer hmm? action. What? Your motion was to defer action. Yes, I'm sorry. Second. Yes. Second. <laughs> Second I thought I was clear with that. Got a little long window with it. Okay. okay. <laughs> any, any other discussion? You okay, Ryan? Okay. You look like you had a question. Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to defer, please signify by raising your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes. It's deferred. Uh, I will... We look forward to seeing you next month. You're up.
great Thanksgiving coming up here next week. Wow. Thanksgiving 2023, next week. Um, thank you to the veterans that re echo on uh, Dr. Lassan's sentiments earlier. Uh, we, we enjoy serving the board and the citizens community. Um, thank you for the time that you put into it as planning board members. And one of the things that, um, that we're going to start to kind of do a better job of, you know, when we talk with people is we don't want to necessarily give people a false hope that it may get to a point. This is kind of a conversation that Mr. Hunter and I had. Sometimes we just have to take it to that next level. We may not get on the same page. Um, so we're going to start letting people know we may, you may not get to a staff approved, a staff approval recommendation. That doesn't mean you don't get your day before the boards and the city council. Okay. So um, we're going to kind of start when we have conversations with people early on, making that as a comment that, you know, anybody can request the, the, the council uh, amend the UDO. Doesn't mean that we're going to support it. We're going to have reasons. Um, we may, or we may in this case, we support some things, but other things we don't. But um, it shouldn't mean that that an applicant doesn't get their opportunity before this board and before city council so that you and the city council can hear their request. So, but um, given the um, second meeting in December, council doesn't have a meeting in uh, that second, which is when we usually take the public hearing items. Um, so that gives, you know, gives another opportunity um, before that meeting. Um, or an applicant could do that regardless. I mean, even if they were planning to be going in front of council in December, they still could say, hey, let me tap the brakes. Let me bring back some information and, you know, we'll see you next month if you'd be you know, gracious enough to see us again next month. And then we'll go to council in January. So it just kind of worked out where we had a little bit of extra time between November and January. So um, I appreciate everybody's time and effort on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have discussion. We <coughs> the motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Motion by Matt. Second, Second. by Steve. <laughs> Meeting adjourned.